afternoon and welcome to Jewish Federation of Orange County's Coping with COVID webinar. We would like to welcome Jewish Federation board member, women's philanthropy president, and clinical social worker and psychotherapist, Jean Durbach, to start our program. Thank you so much. Welcome to everybody. Typically when I speak, I say how wonderful it is for me to look out at the audience and see so many beautiful faces before me, but today I'm not able to do that. I am, however, able to welcome over 160 households within Orange County, and if my mom was lucky in Toronto, Canada, my mother too. I am Nadine Durbeck, and today is an opportunity for the two roles that I truly cher cherish in my professional life to meld together, that of clinical social worker and psychotherapist and women's philanthropy president and new board member for Jewish Federation of Orange County. This is truly an honor. Since the start of Shelter in Place, I have participated in many Zoom calls and presentations by a variety of nonprofits, universities, hospitals, and mental health organizations. And today's presentation is curated information from a variety of those resources and is an amalgamation of that information. This presentation is not meant to be a replacement for psychotherapy or medical advice. And if you or your loved ones are struggling with depression, anxiety, and any other mental health issues, then please reach out to one of us or to your doctor for support and additional resources. COVID-19 has been in our lives for just a few months. And yet, with the amount of changes, losses, fears, and uncertainties that have come along with it, it has induced a great range of emotion. Typically, when we are faced with challenges and stressors in our personal lives, we are struggling individually, perhaps within our marriages, our relationships, and our families. The struggle is on an individual and familial level. This is different, and it feels different. COVID is a communal, national, and international struggle, and perhaps for the first time in many of our lives, we are faced with a challenge that our relatives and friends in other parts of our nation and the globe are faced with too. This is a collective struggle, and the emotions that are evoked are universal, meaning you are not alone. People all over the world may be feeling anything from anxious, angry, confused, scared, sad, lonely, frustrated, isolated. They also may be feeling grateful, loving, compassionate, happy to help a neighbor or a friend in need, and blessed. But the truth is that whatever you're feeling, it is okay. Many people from young children to older, older adults are experiencing that range of emotion during COVID. And we are experiencing feelings that are similar to the six stages of grief. Anything from denial to anger, bargaining to depression, acceptance, and what author and psychologist David Kessler has recently showed us, the sixth stage, finding meaning and purpose. Today's presentation is an opportunity to experience the power of community, and our goals for today's presentation include identifying your unique coping style, learning ways to reduce stress and anxiety, and focusing on a future filled with flexibility, resilience, and hopefulness. I'd like to remind you all to please have your pencil and paper handy We'll do a fun exercise a little later on in our presentation. A little bit of housekeeping. This session is being recorded and can be found on our website at jewishoc.org. All slides are available to view on our website as well. Our esteemed panel of mental health professionals represent expertise across the lifespan from early childhood to adolescence to adults and to older adults, 
and they remind me that our community is rich with these incredible resources. I would now like to introduce my colleagues and our esteemed panel of experts. Sheila Hansen is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a registered play therapist. Sheila's work takes place in her private practice in Newport Beach. Haley Goldberg is a licensed marriage family therapist and parenting coach. And Haley's company is called, uh, I just blanked, I'll get to that later. I didn't have it written down, I'm sorry. Dr. Lisa Grajewski is a clinical and forensic psychologist and her practice focuses on children, adolescents, and adults. Her clinical practice is found in Newport Beach. Kelly Klein is a licensed clinical social worker and Kelly works for Jewish Federation of Orange County, directs our Holocaust survivor program, and is truly our community's expert on aging and caregiving. And at the end of May, we will have another colleague, Kenneth Robotsky, licensed marriage family therapist, to talk to us about men and mental health. So to introduce our program, I'm gonna be talking about six coping styles that people tend to utilize when faced with challenge and stress. I will be going through the coping styles and at the end, we will do an exercise. The first style is belief. People who have belief typically have faith that there's a higher power, that there's a source for their creation. They may be asking, what is the universe trying to tell me right now? What is the meta message in all of this? They may not question this period, and instead they may be saying things like, God has a plan. This is a belief right now, and may be experiencing what's called existential crisis for the first time. They may have a feeling of being betrayed, they may be asking, what kind of a God does this? The next coping style is what we call affect. That's when we are feeling oriented. We look for nonverbal communication. We look for facial expressions in our loved ones. We check in and we ask, how are you feeling versus how are you doing? For those of us that use the coping style of affect, we really feel our feelings. We may wake up in the morning and do an internal temperature check of asking ourselves, how am I feeling today? How am I coping emotionally? And then we reach out to others to check in with them. For those who are socially oriented towards their coping, these are people that have a deep need to be connected to others. These are folks who need other people and the connection with others. This is where they get their energy from and not just on social media. These are people that are trying very hard to pick up the phone, check in, like I said, get their energy from being socially connected. During COVID, I've often said that the, whoever named it social um, distancing, was a little bit off the mark. They probably should have named it physical distancing because there's never been a more important time to be socially connected. Next, we're gonna to move to imagination. Imagination is when people use creativity to cope. These are people who may be dancing their way through this COVID period, creating art, cooking, writing through a creative means. They put all their creative energy into their coping. Then we move to physiological, uh, cognitive. Cognitive is for people who collect information. These are your data analysts. These are people that require statistics, data, information to be able to ascertain whether they're safe and coping well or unsafe and should be concerned about something. There are many, many people using this type of coping style during 
COVID. And the only thing to really remark about this is to make sure that people are getting their information from reputable sources. If you see that you or somebody that you love who tends to cope with cognitive collecting information, their anxiety is rising, there's nothing wrong with reeling back and putting a limit on how much information you or your loved ones are being exposed to. It can be information overload as well. Finally, we get to physiological. These are folks who need to move their way through stress, sweat their way through challenge, and there's psychological impact on our emotional and psychosocial well-beings. Exercise has the ability to lower stress and increase good feeling endorphins. At this point in our presentation, I'm going to ask you all to participate in a poll. It's very easy. We're going to put up a poll. And if you could just take 10 seconds to review which of the following is your natural coping style. And then I'm gonna be able to review the poll results in a few seconds. Okay, if we could have the results. All right, well, amazing. It turns out that we have a very social community. People really, really have a need to be connected with others right now. 42% of you responded that you find that you are coping by being socially connected, relationally engaged with each other. Another one is cognitive. You're collecting information from reputable sources. 21% of you said that you are coping by being cognitively oriented. Next, 17% of you are using your belief, your faith to cope right now. And another 17% of you are exercising your way through this experience by really relying on physiological outlets. And then finally, affect, feeling your feelings. And interestingly enough, um, there were no respondents who said imagination. The next poll I'm gonna ask you to participate in asks the question, choose a coping style that you would like to try next week. So for those of you that may have said you are social or you are cognitive, you're collecting information from news sources, would you be willing to try a different way of coping? So I'll give you 10 seconds and let's see the results on that. Okay, so interestingly enough, this is a very, very, um, amazing response, 53% of you would like to try physiological. You know, it's never too late to start moving, so that's good news. 7% um, of you said cognitive, 13% of you said imagination, 20% of you said you'd like to connect with others, and somebody said that next week they're going to try and be a little more oriented towards their affect, feeling their feelings. Very good. Well, in the next part of our presentation, we're gonna to move to ways to regulate stress and anxiety. Again, if feelings of fear and worry are overwhelming you, and you try the techniques that our mental health professionals are going to share with you right now, and you still feel like you can't cope with your daily tasks, or you're struggling in your interpersonal relationships, please feel free to reach out to any one of us or your physician for support and resources. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Grajewski, clinical and forensic psychologist, whose private practice specializes in children, teenagers, and adults. And Dr. Lisa is going to take you through the first four ways to regulate stress and anxiety. Hi everyone, I'm glad you could be here with us. 
going to go through a few ways to regulate stress and anxiety. And the first, uh, the first exercise that we're going to go through is a grounding exercise. And this is called 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And what this does is it allows us to be in the present moment. So what I'd like you to do, if you would please, it's a very quick exercise. I'm going to have you look around whatever room that you're in and describe to yourself five things that you see in the room. And it can be anything that you see in the room. And now I want you to name four things that you can feel. Perhaps you feel your feet on the floor. Maybe you feel a fan blowing on you. You might feel your bum in the chair. And now name three things that you can hear right now, besides my voice, and come up with something more original. Maybe the traffic outside, a dog barking, the person next to you breathing. And now two things that you can smell right now. Perhaps you have a nice diffuser in your room, or maybe you've been cooking and there's the smell of beautiful food coming from the kitchen. And finally, to name one good thing about yourself. And what this does is it grounds us and allows us to be in the moment. We can also go to our breath. And breath is something that's used in a lot of different types of exercise and helping us feel uh, regulated. We use it in yoga, we use it in meditation. And really the trick to the breath is making sure that when you breathe in, you breathe in four to five counts and you breathe out a little bit longer through your mouth than what you breathe in, so five to six. So imagine maybe for the younger ones, smelling a flower or a bakery and then breathing out like you're blowing out a candle. The third way to regulate stress is exercise. And exercise, of course, is across the span. But what exercise does is it creates feel-good endorphins but it also gives us something that we don't really hear about very often, and that's norepinephrine. And that helps the brain deal with stress more efficiently. And along with mitigating the negative effects of chronic stress on the mind, and the brain, habitual exercise can actually improve mental health. And there's a ton of research out there. If you were to type in uh, exercise and depression, exercise and anxiety, you would find a myriad of literature out there available to find out more information on that. And when you are strenuously exercising, you're actually mimicking the body's response to stress. So it teaches your body to get used to that stress level. Relaxation. This is something that is hard for all of us. It's hard for me. I'm sure it's hard for a lot of people out there. And relaxation doesn't mean just falling apart. It means sitting down and listening to your favorite music. It means deep breathing, maybe using a nice soft yoga class, reading a relaxing book, going for your walk with your dog or a significant other. The other thing that we fail to think of as adults is coloring books, puzzles, and they have these wonderful new paint by number sets that you can order that are really, really relaxing as long as you enjoy it and don't make yourself a perfectionist while you're doing it. The key to relaxation is being able to enjoy what you're doing. And those are the four ways to regulate stress that I'm gonna talk about. And now what I'd like to do is turn this over to my esteemed colleague, Callie Klein. Thank you, Lisa. Um, really great to, to hear that relaxation i think maybe i'm a little too relaxed now to to share but anyway um finding information from reputable sources is really important who do you go to your trust sources are we all have different people uh, for different areas of our life you would not necessarily ask your financial advisor to give you medical advice so it's really important that you go to the right source too much information could be confusing and not give you what you're looking for. 
we all have an innate bias and see the world through our own lens. So take the time to review what you hear and see if it makes sense to you. The news channel's method of obtaining current information are reporting updates that might, may be directed at a location that is different from where you live. Some people speak with a firm voice that gives the impression of authority. So you need to understand that these are their opinions and their assessments and may not be based on science and data. Use your good judgment and err on the side of caution if you're unsure of what to do. Reliable sources of information include the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute on Health, World Health Organization, state, county, and local agencies. If you don't have access to internet and get some information, uh, be a little resourceful. Ask a friend, ask family members to help you and get the information and share it with you. The next one is going into noticing behaviors. Be mindful and aware of your behaviors as well as the behavior of others around you. Try to identify and name the behavior so if you need to modify your actions and responses, you know where you need to work. They have strong influence on how you and others feel and respond to situations. Notice if you're maintaining routines. Are you sleeping well, eating, exercising, resting, working, playing, and connecting with others? Be aware of your past history how you've coped with difficulties or any traumatic events that have impacted your life or the lives of the loved ones around you. Take note of how others behave and assess how it affects you and in turn how your behavior may affect them. Be aware of your surroundings. Are they calming or irritating? Most of us can only change our immediate surroundings minimally and how we perceive and respond to things around us. We have no control over others or world events. Take note of the words that you're using and that others use. These all have an effect on our emotions and could be a door to gaining insight and growth into our own um, emotions. Try not to blame outside influences as the cause of how you feel. Rather look inward. Ask yourself, why am I or why is that person reacting to this situation in this manner? And that way you're able to know that it's coming from a source um, that, that is uh, coming from knowledge and uh, not just a reaction. I now turn it over to Haley, a licensed man, marriage and family therapist who is a parenting coach. Haley. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, the next one that we're coming up is on number seven, becoming aware of our thoughts. So, we may not have control over the circumstances, um, the situation that we're in can't be changed, but what we do have control over are our thoughts, how we think about those situations. And what's really important is that we have to know that our thoughts will influence our emotions. So how we think about something will guide how we feel about something. How we feel about that will influence our, um, our actions or our behavior. So it really becomes important that we do manage our thinking. It's important to know also when it comes to thinking, there's such a thing as negativity bias. With that negativity bias, we're much more, our brain is much more wired towards the negative than the positive. So we need to be aware of that and be aware of the thoughts and those negative thoughts that come up. So what I tell clients to do is catch those thoughts, check those thoughts and then change your thoughts. So when you're feeling anxious, notice those thoughts. What are you telling yourself? Check, catch that thinking. Check your thoughts. Are these thoughts accurate? Are the thoughts reasonable? And then we want to look to see how can we change those thoughts um, especially during COVID and there's so much that's going on for us, we really want to be making sure that if we can catch them and check them, we want to be able to change them. So changing those thoughts is by reframing our thinking or by finding personal meaning in the situation that we're in. So some of the reframes that we can look at, common reframes to change our thinking is, my friends and I can't see each other right now. 
we can change that thinking to my friends and I are protecting each other right now. When we change that thought, it brings about much more hopeful, more positive, more optimistic feelings. The other reframe we can do is I'm stuck at home. Many of us are feeling frustrated. Many of us are feeling overwhelmed being stuck at home. Um, we can change that to being I'm safe at home. And again, if we change the thinking, the, we're going to change the feelings that come with that. Another one, I've lost all my freedom. My kids are saying that to me. Just feel like they're, they're, they're caged in at home. They've lost their freedom. So we're framing that to, I've temporarily relinquished my freedom for a noble purpose of health and safety. And when we can look at that thinking in a different way, we can feel about it differently. If we feel differently, we take on different behaviors and actions. And we may not be able to change the circumstances that we're in, but through our thinking, we can absolutely change the experience of how we experience COVID-19 or how we experience the situation that we're in. So an unmanaged mind is an unhappy mind. We need to manage those, manage our thinking, manage our thoughts and change our emotions. The next one is we're talking about emotions is the ability to lean into our feelings and feel our feelings. We want to feel calm and we all want to feel peace right now. We, we, we're really striving for that. We're trying for that. But the reality is there's so many emotions that are coming up for us right now with COVID that it's not possible. So we may be feeling much more um, overwhelmed, much more confused, much more irritated than we want to be. But we have to have kindness. We have to have grace. We have to know that those feelings are okay. And we can feel those feelings without feeling that there's something wrong with us for having those kinds of feelings. So don't make it mean anything about you to have these big emotions that are coming up. It doesn't mean that you're weak because you have these feelings. It doesn't mean that you need to be embarrassed for having these feelings have those feelings and it's not easy to do especially a lot of us grew up not feeling our feelings we really want to try and avoid our feelings we want to resist our feelings anything but lean into them anything but feel them and i'm encouraging you to try and work during this time to to change those habits of avoiding and resisting and try to lean into those feelings more so be aware of the feelings that are coming up for you and feel them and find someone that you can trust to really listen to you, who will validate your feelings and help you with those feelings. Not somebody, please don't choose someone who's gonna exacerbate those feelings for you. Find someone that's gonna be helpful for you around those feelings. So really taking time to lean into your feelings, feeling those feelings, not judging you for having feelings, not judging your feelings as good or bad is truly gonna be helpful setting you free at this time. Another coping strategy is um, self-care. Self-care is critical at all times for good mental health, but it's even more critical now as we're going through COVID. So finding some extra self-care is important. And there's different ways that self-care can come about, um, different forms. So you can do some comfort activities. That's what most of us think about when we think of of self-care is finding those comfort activities, um, something that helps us feel safe, um, a warm bath, listening to music, taking a walk. Those are certainly comfort activities that are helpful at this time. Self-care can also come in the form of distraction and finding distraction activities to get your mind off of the stress. So doing a puzzle, reading a good book, taking up a new hobby, um, cooking, gardening, something like that is helpful. Um, the calming strategies that we're talking about now are also part of, can also be part of a daily self-care um, routine. So communicating your needs and concerns, not staying glued to the news and choosing a funny TV show to watch instead. Um, following a daily routine is part of self-care. Waking up at the same time, meals at the same time, going to bed at the same time, that's part of self-care. Um, ending your day with a calming ritual, calming routines is self-care. So finding a calming activity at the end of the day, maybe a gratitude list, finding three to five things at the end of the day that you're grateful for and ending your day that way is self-calming. 
Um, exercise is self-help and expressing yourself creatively. So singing, dancing, music, drawing, any of that is self-help as well. So, so many different options for self-help. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sheila Hansen. Sheila is also a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she is a registered play therapist as well. So number 10 is rituals of the everyday, creating routines. And as Haley just mentioned, we need to create routines at this really disruptive time through the COVID-19 virus. And it really does create a sense of normality when we have a daily routine. One way to do this is to structure your day as close as possible to what it was before we were all locked down at home for this uh, stay at home process. For example, wake up, get up, wash up, get yourself dressed and eat breakfast and try to do it at the same time as you did before isolation. And I can't stress enough to you how important these couple of really simple items are to make you feel good each day about yourself. Set aside some separate times to do your non-distracting work, but in areas that are away from the rest of the family. So you have that quiet time to do your work. Same if you have children at home, set up an area that's not in a distractible area for them so they can do their work as well. Try to have your meal times at about the same time every day. Schedule your lunch and your dinner time so that everybody knows they should come back together as a family. They can then you can discuss things together. You can have that social interaction just like you would do if you were going to work or going to school. And then don't forget, kids need to go to bed at a regular bedtime. Not a bad idea for adults to go to, to bed at a regular time all the time as well. It sets a routine. It makes you feel like it's a more normal life that you're living. And it also might help you create the feeling that the weekends are indeed different than the weekdays instead of just a run on of the same thing every day. The next item is social contact and we've mentioned it several times previously but this is a time more than any other time to stay connected with others. Now social distancing as Nadine said earlier is meant to be physically distanced from each other but it doesn't mean to not be in contact with each other. If you're sometimes feeling sad or mad or irritable right now because you can't get out, I know kids are saying they can't be with their friends and they want to go play. You know, there's, there's so many other ways that we can have connection. We are so blessed to live in a time when we have this wonderful technology that's literally at our hands every day. So this would be a good way, a good time for you to start doing some new ways of connecting. You can set up play times with the kids and you can set up you know FaceTime with your computer and their friend's computer and and they can have time together playing a game you can have meals together with family across the country or just down the street when you can't be physically together you can do it on the screen and use technology that way and I, I, I want to remind you that the telephone still works and you can still call people on the telephone and it's always a good idea to just pick it up and chat with somebody. Call somebody every day. Call somebody you haven't talked to in a while. Connect with them. You know, we all have such busy lives that we forget. We've got those friends out there we probably haven't talked to in five years. Pick up the phone and give them a call. It's a great way to get that friendship restarted again. And Let's remember that social distancing means physical distancing. Connect, 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 connect. If you feel like you don't want to talk to anybody during the day and you just want to go hide, that's probably the time you want to pick up the phone and give somebody a call. And last but not least is number 12, our creativity and imagination. Boy, hasn't everybody been so busy in their lives that they think, oh, I should have done this, or I wish I could read that book, or, uh, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to take up painting. Well, guess what? Now's the time to do it. You want to learn how to paint? Do it. 
doesn't matter if you paint the wall in the bedroom or you paint a picture to put on the wall, go paint. You always wanted to read three or four books by an author or even one book that's been sitting on your bedside table, pick it up. You've got the time now, read. Get started with it. Um, a lot of people think it'd be, gee, I'd really like to do, learn how to do something, you know, fix the plumbing because I have a leak under my sink or fix the car or crochet or knit, which by the way is getting popular again. There's this thing called YouTube out there. They've got videos for everything. Log into YouTube, you can find out how to do just about anything you can imagine doing. These kinds of activities will help you feel engaged, will make you get excited about the day instead of, oh, just another day in isolation. Get up and do these things. It'll make you feel good. And then you've got something to talk about with your family. So don't forget how important it is to take care of yourself, these 12 different, different ideas we've given you. Utilize one new one every day and see if it doesn't make life a little better in isolation. And now it's time we're going to go back to Nadine Durbach. She's our wonderful leader here today, our um, licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist. And she's going to take us through an exercise to help with stress and anxiety called Zen Tangle. It's up to you, Nadine. Thank you so much, Sheila. And thank you, Haley, Lisa, and Callie. You guys nailed that. Wow. That was an excellent, excellent presentation, and I appreciate your calm and your insight, your wisdom, and definitely your sense of humor, all of you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, before we get to our pencil and paper, I'm going to ask you to do another poll. I just love the technology that we have at our uh, you know, disposal right now, so let's use it. Uh, we're going to put up a poll that asks you, thinking of the 12 ways to regulate stress and anxiety that you just learned about, how do you currently, if we could put the poll up again, please, how do you currently and typically regulate your stress and anxiety? And you may see that you need to use your mouse to go through the whole list. Um, and you can, you can enter your information, but choose one way that you currently regulate stress and anxiety. And in a few seconds, I'll be able to share the results. Okay, if we could put up the results, all right. All right. Well, it turns out that um, half of you are exercising your way through this and half of you are relaxing your way through this. Okay, the next question that I'm gonna ask you to participate in asks you to consider selecting a new way of regulating stress and anxiety that you would like to try out in the next week or so. So if we could put up that poll, and again, you may have to use your mouse to go through the list and then you can vote select a new way of regulating stress and anxiety that you would like to try next. Okay, a few more seconds, and then we will look at the results. Very good. So in the next week, the majority of you would actually like to become aware of your behaviors. You'd like to notice your behaviors, become aware of your thoughts, which thoughts are causing you stress, and you want to uh, be more mindful of how your thoughts are affecting your emotions and your actions. And then there were quite a few of you who are willing to start moving. You'd like to exercise creating those feel-good endorphins and decreasing your pain and stress levels. And then there were a handful of you who would like to, in the next week, be in the present moment through practicing mindfulness and perhaps breathing, relaxation and breathing with those full yogic deep breaths. Very good. Well, thank you very much for participating in our poll. And if we could close the poll, great. If we could take that down, very good. So if you remember your own childhood or you can close your eyes and remember the childhood of your children, very often it was a lot of fun to take a hand
and to trace the other piece of paper, I'd like you to place your hand on your piece of paper and I'd like you from your wrist all the way through your five fingers to trace the outline of your hand on your piece of paper. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And next, we are going to participate in a relaxation exercise called Zen Tangle. And that's a new word for many of you, and you might be wondering, what is a Zen Tangle? Well, a Zen Tangle is a form of meditative doodling that has unplanned patterns. There is no judgment in this exercise. There are no mistakes. It's simply a way to release and relax through repeated doodling. So now I'd like you to take the next two minutes and fill up your traced hand with your very own Zentangle. And I'll give you all two minutes to do that exercise. Okay, less than a minute. Remember, there's no judgment, there's no need for perfection. Okay, about 30 seconds to complete your Zentangle. Okay, well, I'm going to assume most of you are finished, and even if you're not, that's okay. You can try this again later on, maybe with a partner or a child or a loved one. And I'm going to put up a poll because I'm curious what the experience of completing the Zentangle was like for you. How did the Zentangle experience make you feel? Did you feel emotionally calm? Did you have a physical, physiological sensation where your body felt significantly more relaxed? relaxed? Did you feel present? Were you really tuned in to the experience of filling in your hand? Not much else on the brain other than doing the repeat pattern. Was it neutral for you? Did you just not really feel much of anything? Or was it anxiety provoking for you? So if you could just respond to that and let's put up the poll. And it turns out that this was a very beneficial exercise for the majority you because most of you said that you felt present. There were a few of you, next you felt emotionally calm, some of you felt anxious, others felt neutral, and uh, just a handful felt physically relaxed, but really most of you felt present and emotionally calm. So that was just two minutes of a judgment-free, calming exercise where honestly, if you're feeling a day where anxiety, you've learned of ways to regulate your stress and anxiety, now you have number 13, Zentangle. All right, so there we go. Anyways, now I would like to take it back to Sheila Hansen. Sheila. All right, now we want to introduce to you the daily quarantine questions. These are really some things you can do to support positive thinking, resilience, strength, and a hopeful future. You can write these down in post-it notes, put them on your refrigerator to remind you, you know, to, that you need to look at them and think about them. You can talk about them with your family at night around a dinner table. And we really want you to be challenging yourself to, to look at these either daily or weekly or on a regular basis. The first one is, what am I grateful for today? We know that grateful people tend to be happy people, but maybe... Think of five, six things, three things that you're grateful for today. There's a lot to be grateful for today. Next would be, who am I checking in with or connecting with today? We just talked about connecting. Who are you reaching out to? 
keep those connections going. Keep talking to people. It makes you feel good when you reach out and connect to somebody else and talk with them. And then now we're going to go over to Haley Goldberg, our licensed marriage and family therapist and our parenting coach. Take the next ones. Thanks, Sheila. All right. So the next one is um, looking at what expectations of normal am I letting go of today? So this is our new normal for now. And we may have our everyday expectations and standards that we have. And that's, you know, that's great. That's fine. But in this time now, what can we let go of? So I'm sharing with families, we really need to have our pandemic normal. What does that look like? What are things that are creating a lot more stress um, that you don't need in your life right now that you can let go of? There's so much that we, do, that we are working and juggling that have to get done. Some of it we don't have to. So what are those expectations? Look at the things that you are struggling with and you, the expectations before you adjust those expectations. How are those things limiting you? So again, think of the things that are stressing you, think of the things that are limiting you. And those are good things that see if there's a way that you can change expectations for now. We can always go back to same expectations. We can always go back to our true normal expectations when the pandemic is done. But for now, we need to create a new set of expectations. And that may mean for a time, we just need to lower some expectations and that's okay. Um, the next question is, how am I getting outside today? So there's two pieces to that. Um, we're looking at that literally, how are you getting outside? What physical exercise are you doing? How are you taking in nature? Are you going for a walk? What does that mean? How are you physically moving and being outside? But the other piece is, how are you getting out of your head? So metaphorically, how are you getting out of your head and, ref and getting out of the, that stress? So again, some of the things we spoke about with reframing your thoughts, distracting yourself with a fun activity, reading a book, being social, connecting with a friend, all great ways, playing, having fun, great ways to make sure that you get out of your head, um, mental health strategies to help you during this time. And I think we're turning it over to Lisa for the next set of questions. Thank you, Haley. So how am I moving my body today? And how do we increase endorphins? So how I move my body may be different to how you move your body. Doesn't have to be intense aerobic. Um, some of us enjoy that. Some of us like running. Some of us like cycling. But there are other things that can be less intense aerobic activities try dancing or even going for a walk, just moving. And remember I discussed that wonderful unsung neurotransmitter uh, norepinephrine, right? Well, that neurotransmitter does a lot of things for us. Not only does it help our brains feel better, but it also improves stress and it helps us sleep better. And when we have better sleep, we're gonna have a better day the following day. And that's gonna be really, really important in this, um, this current pandemic because there's a lot of talk of folks having very strange sleep patterns, nightmares, dreams, etc. So making sure that you're keeping your body moving, even getting out there to walk your poor dog that's probably getting six to seven walks a day and isn't used to having all those walks during the day. So just remember moving doesn't have to be kill yourself aerobic. It can be gentle, it can be kind, it can be wonderful. And now I'm going to pass it on to Callie Klein. Okay, um, and my the final question that we ask ourselves during the time with the screen today. We are the masters of our outlook every day. We choose every hour, we get to choose how we see things. We need to be mindful of the three senses gardening, growing things, small things that are simple and easily done and play some music. Sing. The one I love and I've heard over and over again through, through the, the last six weeks is we're all cultivating relationships. We're talking to people, we're WhatsApping, we're doing video chats, we're, we're connecting to people, and it really is cultivating and, and, and building those relationships that are so important to us. So there are many different ways that we can create 
create beauty and bring it into us. Whether I'm doing my cleaning and I decide to rearrange the pillows or put the pillow bag on, it just turns up and looks like the place is different. Opening the windows, bringing to the, to the birds thing or the insects, you know, there's so much that we can do to really know that we are bringing in um, beauty and, and enjoyment into our lives. I'm going to hand it back to Haley for uh, uh, closing. All right, thanks, Kelly. Hopefully, we have our resources slide up there. Um, I wanted to just remind you guys as this presentation, this webinar is coming to a close. We have a few questions that we'll be answering, but I want to first remind you that Jewish Federation of Orange County has a website. Um, they've got um, COVID-19 community resources on that page. And those resources, resources are being updated every day. So check that resource, check that website for um, resources and information daily. Um, there's also the information that's on your screen now for all of our panelists uh, um, to connect with us as a resource, as well as information on other sites that you can go to in the areas of our um, expertise. So look through those resources. It's another place that you can go. And remember at the beginning when you, had, when you registered for the webinar, there was the opportunity to um, register for breakout sessions. Each of us is going to be hosting a different breakout session. So we have some questions that we're going to be answering now, but we couldn't get to all the questions. There were some really fabulous questions that came in for today. Unfortunately, with time restraints, we can't get to all those questions. So we're going to answer just the five first questions that came in for today. But please make sure that you check in with um, the different um, experts on the panel today and, break, and register for one of the breakthrough ses breakout sessions, because there, there be smaller sessions you'll be much more able to ask your specific questions around your stage of life and we can um, make sure that everybody's questions get answered that way so with that i'm going to turn back to sheila who's going to lead us with some of the questions that we're going to be answering for you now all right the question that i have uh, to respond to is what do you do if a feeling of claustrophobia strikes? I have found that it's triggered when I haven't gone outside for a walk in three days, or if I turn on the news, although I'm limiting it to once a week, but even then it's hard. So yeah, claustrophobia right now, I'm sure you are not alone. A lot of people are feeling very much housebound, but, but remember what we talked about, about setting a schedule. Create a daily schedule for yourself. Try to stick to that schedule and be sure to incorporate in it getting outside on a regular basis. Maybe you need to just poke your head outside, maybe look around what's going on in the yard. But get outside every day on a regular basis. And remember when you do go for your walks and you are outside, pay attention to what is going on around you. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What do you smell? Is it the flowers in bloom with the springtime and this warm summer weather we're having? What is going on? Do you feel the sun on you? Do you feel the wind on you? Just be present in that moment. We had a poll recently up here that talked about being present takes very little effort and very little time. So get outside and feel present in what's going on around you. Next, be sure you're reaching out and connecting with others. If you're starting to feel these feelings, be sure and reach out, call somebody, talk to somebody. Oh, and ask for the news. Yeah, that's a tough one because we, we all tended to stick to the news and just got more and more anxious about it. But how about keeping that limited? If it's the weather you're looking for, the sports you're looking for, just limit it to that little bit of information that you want. And as you start to build up your reserves about feeling better, maybe you can reach out and touch a little bit about what's going on with COVID. The one thing I tell clients over and over again right now, don't watch the news just before going to bed if that makes you very anxious. Calm down, watch it at a, during a period of the day when you feel strong. And we were talking about breathing. Breathing is so important to help regulate. When you start to feel those anxious feelings come up, breathe. Breathe in for the count of three, breathe out for the count of five, and do it as slowly as you can. Remember to do it when you're starting to feel those feelings coming up. 
not when they're way up here. It's easier to stop a car when it's going five miles an hour than when it's going 100. So just do it when you start to feel those feelings and tell yourself, I'm healthy, I'm safe, I'm going to be okay. Continue doing what you're doing, get yourself outside, reach out to other people, and just try instituting some of the methods we've had here today and utilize them to help calm yourself down before you get too wound up from everything that we're seeing and hearing what's going on. And absolutely, always, if it gets worse, reach out to a therapist, reach out to a doctor, reach out for some additional help. Uh, Dr. Lisa. Thank you, Sheila. So the next question, when isolation is one of the worst things you can do with lifelong treatment resistant depression, PTSD, anxiety, and you live alone, no pets, and are forced into isolation, how to cope with overwhelming feelings and despair when you're tired of looking at screens for Zoom or Skype? That is a lot, and we all understand how difficult this time is. And I guess, unfortunately, but fortunately, if we can re-spin that, we're all in this together. And we really do understand what everyone is going through in their own way. I think what I would say first and foremost is take the time to understand and maybe use some of the tools that you've learned today that while this is isolating, it doesn't have to be isolation. And what I mean by that is taking the opportunity to go outside, say hello from a safe distance, call a friend, a therapist, a loved one, talk about how you're feeling. Really, really be open to sharing those feelings with somebody that you feel safe with. Try a new task. There's crocheting, as, as Sheila was saying, there's all kinds of YouTube videos available. And that being said, I challenge you to try and develop a new relationship with your screen. And instead of seeing it as the enemy, see it as a tool for you to be able to connect and not feel so isolated. Learn to play an instrument. Ukulele is really easy to learn on YouTube and it's a lot of fun. Bake some cookies and take those cookies to a neighbor, a loved one, or a friend. And most important is allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. It's okay. It is okay to feel all these feelings that everyone is feeling during this time. And more importantly, don't forget self-care. This is really, really important during this time that you take care of yourself. And if the feelings and thoughts are overwhelming and disturbing to a point of concern, please contact a mental health professional. Do not wait until you can't take it anymore. If you feel like you need to speak to somebody, you call a therapist, you call a psychiatrist, and make sure that you get taken care of. And with that, I'm gonna transition over to Callie. Hi, so my question comes from a, a senior who, um, uh, is married and, and living at home, but has lots of feelings of sadness and loneliness, getting dressed every day and doing the, the routine, but not finding value in what they're doing. Um, playing a, a lot of games on their I, iPad and feeling a little worthless and that they're wasting time. They are in good health. So, um, you know, seniors and people who are retired, um, their routine is different to those that are working and it's not uncommon for seniors to feel lonely and isolated even when they're um, within their family system. Uh, many times they can't share their deepest feelings because there are a variety of reasons that um, hold them back. Uh, don't be so hard on yourself when you're not doing something productive. You know, playing computer games has been shown to have a very positive effect for the brain and memory. Um, some games also stimulate reaction times and improve dexterity, which is important for fine motor movement to keep you going and doing things that you normally do, uh, that you take for granted. But most important, you need to switch it up, call a friend, go for a walk, play a wide variety of games on the computer or iPad, and don't just keep doing the same thing over and over. We all need some downtime and taking a break, um, or time to relax, will oftentimes give you the strength to do things that will come up later or, or that you need to do tomorrow. 
don't, don't see the glass as half empty or half full. It doesn't matter. And remember, it's always refillable. We can continue to, to do things and, and keep um, uh, recharging. No one can replace you. You are resilient. And practice your attitude of gratitude that you have your health and that you're not alone. I'm going to hand it over to um, Lady. Okay, Kelly, actually, there's one more question that still needs to be answered before we go back to Nadine. So the fifth question that came in for us today um, was a question that was asked that says, there's a lot more fighting happening between my children and we're yelling at our kids. We seem to be juggling so much more. How do we stop the fighting between our kids? How do we stop and how do we yell less? So here, the reality of the situation is, we're all struggling. We're struggling as parents. Our kids are struggling as well. Everybody's given up a lot. Many of our kids are, they're bored, they're tired, they're not enjoying homeschooling. No offense to parents who are doing their, really, their best with it, but kids are struggling with that homeschooling. And um, they're tired of having their only playmates being siblings. They miss being with their friends. So for everybody in the family, our emotional tanks are running that little bit higher. So we're going to see more fighting. We're going to be overwhelmed. There's a lot more yelling, raised voices happening from parents. Some things to think about is um, think about how much time are you spending with your kids ordering, directing, and correcting them? That gets hard on kids as well. So take a step back from the ordering, the directing, and correcting, and find time for play and fun. Play is just a natural way for us to connect again as a family. When we can um, kind of or orchestrate the play between siblings, that brings a lot more fun into the family and the play between siblings. So finding ways that it, you can have fun together, whether that's outside, um, playing you know, sidewalk chalk or bubbles, um, games that you can play outside, or if it's inside and doing a puzzle together or playing Jenga or some family board games, great ways to make sure that we can balance out that ordering, directing and correcting and stress on our kids and having fun. When everybody steps into that play mode, um, it's a natural stress reliever as well. The yelling is hard. We wanna be mindful of that. If we can get that yelling down, always better. But I share with parents so often that there's never a wasted parenting moment. We either do great and we are able to manage that yelling and keep our emotions in check. Sometimes we just can't and we do yell. You always have the opportunity for repair. So coming back to your kids, apologizing, letting them know that you were feeling overwhelmed, that you were stressed, that you're gonna work on that yelling. Let's have more fun together. Let's play so we don't have so much um, stress happening. But come back and repair. And we can use that as an amazing teaching moment with our kids, how to repair in relationships. So be easy on yourself, be kind on your kids, be kind to yourself, have grace for you, grace for your kids. Never a wasted parenting moment, even if you do yell. But get out there, play, have fun. It's another way to reconnect and reduce some of that stress and anxiety that's happening for everyone. And with that, I'm going to send it back to Nadine for some final, some final thoughts before we're done. Okay, I had, thanks, Haley. I had a technical issue right at the time when it was my question, so I appreciate you jumping in. But I'd like to share the question because I'm sure that the person who sent this in uh, represents many, many people who are struggling with this right now. And this has to do with marriage and relationships during COVID. The question is how to cope with an already stressful relationship in a marriage. So basically, you know, when I read that, I thought to myself, well, it's really hard to know what stressful relationship in marriage really means. Is that stress related to parenting differences? Is that stress related to money concerns pre-COVID, during COVID? Is that stress related to job worries and job stressors, emotional distancing from each other? Could that stress be related to illness in a partner, one or the other not being well? Is that stress related to in-law issues, et cetera, et cetera? So I think it's really important to say, what were the pre-existing conditions in our marriage before COVID? Now, if this is more than that, um, and obviously if there's any form of abuse or dysfunction, my answer is not for those marriages. And those marriages, abusive marriages and dysfunctional marriages really are marriages that need to get the attention of a mental health professional. 
Um, stress in marriage actually can be typical and can be healthy in that working through the stress can actually bring the couple closer together and increase relational intimacy. Quarantine is placing a giant magnifying glass on all of our relationships, our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our spouses or partners, our relationships with our children and our relationships with ourselves, especially marriage right now because we're really on top of each other. So if marriage is good and healthy, then of course we moan, we fetch about each other, we make each other annoyed. But in a good, healthy relationship, the magnifying glass is only going to show what's good and healthy. However, if the relationship is not so good, not so healthy, the magnifying glass is obviously going to um, show that there are cracks in the relationship and it's going to make the relationship appear worse, more intense, more unmanageable and more unhealthy. So what can you do about that? Well, you know, my colleagues and I have really tried to stress the point of self-care. So you wanna make sure that you take time for yourself doing your self-care activities. And we understand from today's presentation that there are a myriad of ways to do that and that that could look different for each person. Even in a relationship or in a marriage, I choose to have bubble baths for self-care and my spouse may choose to read or my, my spouse may choose to go for a walk. I may choose to confide and talk to a trusted and caring friend. My spouse may choose to do something entirely different. But the point is that you want to find what works for you. And additionally, you want to find a quiet time when you and your partner are both calm and have the capacity to be kind, uphold the dignity of the marriage or the relationship, and actually talk. There's never been a better time to really talk. And if you don't know how to initiate the conversation, if you are intimidated by communicating with your partner, that is exactly when sessions with a therapist and starting therapy, right now we're doing teletherapy, um, to look at the cracks in the relationship, and to really, you know, up the ante on the vulnerability, the honesty, the trust. This experience, actually taking a look at what is going on in your formative relationships can be a very, very constructive and therapeutic process. It's good to remember that in most marriages, COVID does not represent the first stressor, right? Like you have gone through challenge before. This time is an opportunity to get more in touch with the people within our homes who we truly value versus the people who we typically see outside of our homes, in our communities, in our jobs, in our volunteer work, in our schools, in our cafes and restaurants. And we tend to place so much emphasis on filling up the calendar with that COVID is now a time to really take stock of our priorities and prioritizing our marriages and our relationships. Okay, so um, of course, I hope you can't hear the gardening service outside, but that would happen right now. But anyways, um, you have all been a tremendous uh, audience. I'd like to wrap it up. I'd like to remind you to please go to www.jewishoc.org to get a copy of this program, to get a copy of the slides, to look at our COVID-19 um, our COVID community resource page that's being updated daily. And really to please remember that you are not going through this alone. Jewish Federation of Orange County is here for you. We are here for good. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the panel for their incredible collaboration, their wisdom and support of community mental health. You've all been tremendous to work with, so thank you to all of you. I'd like to thank our board of directors for supporting this idea and this initiative. I'd like to thank the incredible Jewish Federation of Orange County staff. Their time, their talent, and their energy to really produce this program has been remarkable. And I like to think that we're really nothing without our staff. So thank you so much to all the staff and you know who you are. Thank you so much. And finally, thank you to all of our participants for taking you know, the time this afternoon to try and understand a little bit more about coping with COVID. We certainly hope that the information that we've provided has been useful and purposeful. And uh, I encourage you to think about what you wanna try out next week in terms of your own unique coping style and ways to regulate stress and anxiety. 
And please do go to our website to sign up for future um, uh, individual sessions with each of us. Thanks so much. Stay well and Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.